We're going to look now at the two readings, Isaiah 50 and Philippians 2, so that we have the last two sessions to just make remarks on the Passion Narrative to help get ready things that you might want to incorporate when you preach, if you're going to be the preacher or the listener. Um, but first we'll do these texts, okay. Um, the first one is from one of the servant songs. I want to say a word about these servant songs. Somebody abstracted them from the texts. See? And somehow they floated around in imagination as self-subsisting texts. They aren't. They never were. I don't think they were then I don't think they've ever been independent of where they are. This is the mysterious servant who's been talked about over and over and over again, alluded to, and now, you see, and there are really five songs. So there's four here, and then there's Isaiah 61. Again, this, the servant is speaking. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. And there's another servant song. So think of them as part of the context even though we don't have time to look at the context. But uh, the, the first one we use, this is not the first in the series. Uh, this is the first that we use here because of uh, what it says. Adonai, Adonai Natanli Lishon. The, um, the Lord God has given me a tongue. In Arabic, somebody who can speak well and forcefully got a big mouth. That's not a compliment in our language, but it is in theirs. And so, um, uh, to um, open the... That I might know how to sustain the weary with a word. Can a word sustain the weary? Oh, yes. If it's the right word. If it's a word that brings Christ. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. That's the argument for morning prayer. Morning by morning, if we'll get up and listen to him, he will speak like this to us. Okay? The Lord has opened my ear, which as you know is that whole phrase, probably alluding to that if a man wants to be the slave of a Hebrew man, the Hebrew man, slave of another Hebrew man, he takes him to the, the uh, fence post of his house and he drives it all through his ear, earlobe. And that means he's open to obedience to this man the rest of his life. And so that's where the text is changed in um, Hebrews, but we're not going to look at that right now. Um, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. But now, listen to the prophecy of the Passion. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. I know that I will be killed, but I know that I will rise. I will not be put to shame. That's that servant song, the third one. This prophet sees this person, this servant of God, Eved Adonai, and he sees that as he preaches the truth, he's going to be tortured. But this prophetic insight, he knows that that's not going to break him. This servant coming, this one that is you know, going to give, going to have the tongue of a teacher and know how to sustain the weary with the word, he himself, morning by morning, is wakened to listen as those who are taught. You see? And the Lord God has opened my ear to be a servant. And I was not rebellious. 
I did not turn backward. So that when it started to happen, I gave my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. Isn't this what happened at the, at the, in the praetorium? Right? They beat him. They slapped him in the face. I mean, that's right there in the gospel text. Written in such a way that we're meant to see the allusion to this text. Okay? Um, I did not hide my face from insult. I didn't duck. And spitting. They spit. Says so. They spit on it. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I did not buckle. I am about the will of my Father, and I am going to do it out of love. I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. I'll be di- I'll die insulted and mocked, but on the third day I will rise to be the source of life for all who will have me. There's a lot in that prophecy. Okay. Now the second text we're going to look at is uh, Philippians. Famous text, right? Uh, Have the mind in you which was in Christ Jesus, uh, who was existing in the form, morphe, the word morphological. Well, anyway, he exists in the form of God. He's going to take on the form of a slave. Well, it's a real slave, right? So he's really God. Understand? Morphe, theu, morphe uh, of the slave. Okay. And I may know how to sustain the weary, right? Have this, so think like this. He's just as in the Philippians text, he's talking about division. Philippians was Paul's favorite community. But he worried about them because they fight a lot. In fact, later on in the letter, he says, Evodia and Syndiki, two women leaders, I beg you, get along. And to the leader of the whole community, help these good women. They've given their life to serving the Lord. Now they're fighting. You know, help them. So, there's this problem. So here, right in the beginning, he says, you see, um, in the part that we don't have in our text, thinking one another greater than yourself, honor one another, and so forth. Then, after having described this situation, he takes it deeper. It's Christ we're imitating. This happens all the time in Paul. He's talking about unruliness at the Eucharist in one core, one Corinthians. He stops and he gives the institution of the Eucharist. That's the reason why. We shouldn't neglect the poor or stuff our face or not take care of others when we're at the liturgy because we are imitating and entering into that act of love which Jesus gave himself in the Eucharist because he gave himself on the cross. You see how it goes? A, B, A. So the A is get along with each other. And the motive? The act of love in which Christ died which is at the very root of the church, holds the church together. It's by that act that we live if we're alive. <clears throat> so he says, you see, he didn't think this was our pogmos. It wasn't something to be snatched at, something to be brandied about, brandished about, um, to be equal to God. So you have it already. He's equal to God. But he emptied himself. Can you imagine? This is the servant. He emptied himself, taking on the form, the same word, morphe, of a slave. Being found in the likeness of men and uh, uh, having their way of life, as it were. And then he humbled himself even more becoming obedient unto death. Death on a cross. The only thing that would be shocking enough in our culture, death in the electric chair. The most humiliating and painful way to die. 
And that's what he did. Why did he do that? You see? To save us. And to give us a church where we can live. Love and be loved. Bring people to a place of home for themselves. Preach it. Be proud of it. Know what it means to live in the church. You see? Dio. Therefore, God, the Father, um, raised him up. It's an allusion to another servant song, the last one. Behold, my servant shall be raised. Same word. Um, and um, a Christo gave freely from his own generosity the name which is above every name. What is the name above every other name? The Jews don't even pronounce it. Adonai. That's the name. He gave him that name. What does that mean? He didn't have it before? No. Now it radiates through his whole humanity. You see? And so he raised him up. He bestowed on him the name above all names so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, first in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Kyrios. Kyrios is the Greek translation of Yahweh. And getting there, you see, there is a text <clears throat> gave him the name. It's in Isaiah 45, 24. I didn't note enough of these right here. But um, turn to me and be safe. You see, I have everything God is saying. And he gives him that name. So that, see, Kyrios, Lord, after a while the Jews did not say Yahweh. They don't say it today. And so we've dropped it even out of some of our hymns out of respect for them. They used to say it all the time. But then this custom got in and here we are. But, um, but so in the Septuagint, in the Greek translation of the Bible, wherever you have Yahweh, you have Kyrios. You understand? So that when you say Jesus Christ is Kyrios, you're saying Jesus Christ is divine. That's why nobody can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Because you're saying this man of Nazareth, yes, he died and rose. That's great. But it's still, you know, it's another step to be divine. He is divine. That's how we get ready for Holy Week. Look at this divine person. Beaten, insulted, mocked. Can you plumb the depth of that? Abandoned? What are we talking about? How deep does the love of God go that he would get down in the mud with us further than we ever get and be you know, nailed to a cross Naked up there, everybody laughing at him. Come on down if you're so good. Same as you're going to see. Same taunt as, or, or test as, as Satan. If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. If you are the Son of God, come on down from the cross. It's still Satan speaking to these people. Getting at him. <laughs> I don't think his darkened intellect could get that the man on the cross was divine. And he could get close. And that hatred would carry through the whole passion. <laughs>